Sony Summit in Boston and today we have with us once again Gabe. So Gabe, I mean, we have met before, but quickly, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Gabe Monroy. I'm the head of product for uh, Azure Containers, so covering a lot of our open source container technology inside of Azure, including things like our Kubernetes service. Um, I was here at Cloud Foundry Summit talking about open service broker API, which is something we feel pretty passionate about and how that works sort of integrates with uh, Kubernetes. But um, you know, also wanted to, to you know, spend the time to talk to you a little bit about um, some, a new announcement we have around Azure Container Instances, which mm -hmm. is, I think, pretty exciting stuff. Right, yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. What are you doing at Cloud Foundry yeah. <laughs> Summit? Uh, so so I think it's about around uh, serverless, right? And serverless is a kind of new term. Is it an evolution of you know, the app delivery that we have been seeing, or is something just suddenly came out of nowhere? Well, you know, I think like most of these terms that catch the public's imagination, it's a, a little bit of a mixed blessing. I think serverless isn't exactly uh, descriptive. The, the best way that I've found, the best definition I've heard for serverless is a conflation of three different attributes. Okay. Um, the first one is invisible infrastructure. You know, the mm -hmm. idea that you don't have to worry about things like virtual machines, network cards, any of these physical or, you know, uh, concepts. Um, the other is microbilling, right? You know, people want this really granular right. type billing model that allows them to pay truly for what they consume. And, you know, the third one is this event-based programming model, right? This idea yes. of sort of function-based execution. And I think when you think about things like Azure Functions or AWS Lambda, you know, it's really all three of those things, invisible infrastructure, microbilling, and event-based or functions-based programming model. What's interesting about Azure Container Instances is that it removes the last one, the functions-based programming model, but it keeps the invisible infrastructure and the microbilling model. And that's incredibly empowering for people because for a lot of folks, um, some of these functions run times can be you know, a little bit uh, you know, encumbering, right? Like there's only so many languages that are supported. Um, you know, being driven by events is nice for a lot of cases and in others, it's not necessarily what you want. Um, and with Azure Container Instances, you get these benefits, you know, no virtual machines to manage, uh, super fast spin up time, but you get this container artifact that people really understand so they can model any workload that you can model in a container and get the benefits of serverless. And you know, that's why we're starting to call it serverless containers right. because we actually think that's probably the most descriptive term. But uh, it's also that there is a server in serverless computers. It's, there's, it's, it's just you abstract things from the perspective of developer or you know, operator, but there is a server. Somebody is managing and running it. So, so from, from, uh, from Microsoft perspective, uh, uh, what are the benefits you know, that people get by moving to a serverless you know, architecture? From from developer's perspective, how things become you know easier for them that they just you know they take the code, run it as function, they don't have to worry about everything else. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, I think that, that there's definitely a programming model that comes with sort of a serverless style, what be that serverless containers or serverless functions. And you know, like with most things in IT these days, agility and the ability mm -hmm. to move faster tends to be the biggest motivator for anyone. Uh, you know any you know enterprise who who's looking to you know bet on on these technologies. So definitely agility is up there. But you know back to the billing. You know I think there's one point on the billing that's uh, you know interesting, and and I think it's a little bit more subtle, and people tend to miss it. And I think it could it could be actually pretty important going forward. Um, you know if you think about how you optimize code, mm -hmm. right? Um, you could say well this function is you know uh, or you know or component in my system is using a lot of performance. Where do you optimize, right? Where do you, you know, you know, if something's slow or, or you know, could be faster, where do you optimize? By having uh, your compute directly, you know, build for, you know, each individual component in your system having a bill associated with it, it makes it much easier mm -hmm. to, to, you know, decide where you want to put your effort in terms of optimizing your code, right? right? Maybe something's slow in your system, right? But if it's only costing you, you know, a fraction of a percent of the overall bill, you want to focus focus on the thing that's costing you 50% of your bill and optimizing that. And that mm -hmm. be, that type of data starts to become very clear when you look at, you know, sort of a serverless right. billing model. Right. And is, uh, is function, I mean, I don't know, depending on who you talk to, some people prefer the term serverless, some prefer the function as a service. Uh, it, it's not a sil sil silver bullet for, for all the application. There's only certain use cases 
where you can use this uh, model. That's true, and 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 I argue it's it's always been true. I think mm -hmm. you know I, the the past, present, and future of IT is heterogeneous, mm -hmm. right? And you know we have you know virtual machines living alongside containers, living alongside functions, living alongside you know, you know physical servers and data centers. Um, you know all of this stuff is additive, right, to the mix, and you know that's part of what makes it so challenging for enterprises is that you know you don't typically get to remove all that much right. um, over time as you start to add new things. Um, and you know, frankly, I think that's why things like Kubernetes are so important because you know, a lot of the talk here at the Cloud Foundry Summit has been around sort of trying to unify the Cloud Foundry and, and Kubernetes communities. And part of this is driven by the CNCF. So I actually sit on the board of the CNCF right. where I represent Microsoft. And you know, having Amazon and Microsoft and Google and IBM and Oracle all agreeing that Kubernetes is like the de facto plumbing for this layer in the stack. Um, that's empowering to the industry and, and benefits customers, right? Because now we can all kind of move on to the next thing and you know, sort of you know, standardize on that going forward. So I think that kind of thing really helps mm -hmm. with dealing with heterogeneity because um, you, know, you can start to stack up all this stuff on top of the plumbing that we've all agreed upon. Right, and, and I mean, as somebody who has been covering open source for so, so long, it's, it's also kind of exciting to see that you know open source has kind of become a mode of uh, bringing all those competitors together as collaborators where they work on the same code base while their sales team fight in the market. So it's cool too. You, you know, what, what, one interesting story about that is when the Kubernetes uh, conformance program came out, mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty interesting how that developed. So the idea was that, you know, the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation would come up with a certification suite or like a test suite that would, you know, say whether you had compliant Kubernetes or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, what ended up happening was, you know, uh, you know, we were able to all agree pretty rapidly, all these different vendors agree on what the suite was. We sort of, you know, had some you know, honest disagreements about it, resolved them, shipped it out, and now everyone is sort of bought in on this model. So okay. um, it speaks well to the future of open, open source. Right. And we have not seen, you know, so many cases where all these players have agreed on, you know, I think Kubernetes is one, maybe VMs could be another, but often it doesn't happen. Often they don't, yeah, yeah. right? Um, and, and you know, I think that that's where things like ACI are interesting, right? Because you know, with ACI, you know, we were sort of you know first to market and and first. Yeah, to, let's talk about ACI yeah. now. You know, the, the announcement you have made at the. Just tell us a bit more about. What yeah, you did. so you know, the idea is that you know, as I was kind of mentioning before, you know, we have this. Um, serverless con container concept, which brings the invisible infrastructure and the microbilling without the event-based programming. Um, and what's great about this is when we were uh, launching it, like we didn't know because it, it was a, it's a first of its kind, brand new compute primitive, which mm -hmm. I think pretty rare in public cloud to have something you know so new and and so you know really uh, you know interesting. Um, and you know, later when AWS came out with Fargate, which was you know sort of an echo and a riff on, on on the same idea, you know I think it it points to this desire from customers for something that has some of these features of serverless, but with the flexibility of containers. Mm -hmm. um, and so with ACI, what you get is you know you get the ease of use of sort of a simple API surface. Um, you get the speed of containers. I mean, these things start up in you know ten or twenty seconds, which mm -hmm. is uh, pretty right. impressive. Um, and they're also hypervisor isolated, so you can run. And in fact, you know one of the case studies that we published with this is a you know a, a company called Jadox um, out of Germany, and they're sandboxing their customers' trial accounts inside of you know these um, you know container instances and so when the trial's done they sort of you know are able to evaporate um, and it's much more cost effective for them to do that using ACI than it is to stand up a bunch of VMs uh, to manage those same trials you, you gave an example. what kind of other you know use cases are, are you targeting with ACI uh, ACI yeah well you know uh, as with any general compute primitive like VMs it can really be used for anything right yeah, so so I think that's the first thing to note is that like like anything you can run in a container can run an ACI, long living jobs, short lived jobs. That said, we do see a niche, um, and, you know, a lot of folks are interested in using this for burst capacity for mm -hmm. things like data processing, um, ETL jobs, um, event based computing, you know, responding to functions and, you know, having work that's processed by a container. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing is, is really, I, I think, the sweet spot right now. 
even you uh, talk about event based uh, iot also plays a big role in you know where you have like sensor they trigger one thing so how how will it can it be consumed in the iot space um well, i i fully expect um aci to be consumed in, in in that space i think today um you know there are typically other options that folks are using mm -hmm. functions has a lot of traction you know functions as sort of like a first class you know functions as a service style primitive um we're seeing a lot of that mixed with iot and i think that makes a lot of sense um, but there are definitely cases where, you know, for example, um, take like a, a, something that needs to do image processing, mm -hmm. right? Image processing requires using an image library like OpenCV, mm -hmm. right? It's really difficult to get that stuff into a function's runtime, right? Um, but if you get to build your own container that has the libraries that you need, um, it turns out to be a lot more you know, flexible and, and sort of can adapt to the, you know, you know, the, the customer's needs. Right. Uh, well, it, uh, there is name, you know, Azure there, but today people also talk about hybrid cloud and multi-cloud strategy. So how closely tied it, is it to the Azure or it is just Azure only? Uh, uh, is it on the container instance? Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, it is definitely, uh, you know, uh, Azure um, only, uh, you know, and, and, you know, though, you know, Fargate is, is sort of, um, comparable, you know, ACI is actually much faster. You know, mm -hmm. far, uh, ACI is about 10 to 20 seconds on the average container. Fargate tends to be around 100 to 120 seconds. So, you know, order of magnitude slower there. Um, you know, but what, what I would say is that, uh, you know, there are ways that we are trying to bridge this with the community. So one of the projects that we announced at KubeCon um, in Austin was this project called the Virtual Kubelet. Mm -hmm. And what the Virtual Kubelet does is it, it's a standard way to get these serverless container runtimes like ACI mm -hmm. plugged into Kubernetes so mm -hmm. that folks can use Kubernetes APIs um, but actually have the stuff running on ACI. Right. Now that project, is we're actually um, uh, working closely with Amazon VMware um, on this project that, that we announced um, because they all are interested in, in you know getting their serverless container runtimes, Fargate, you know, right. for example, for AWS, um, integrated in with Kubernetes as well. So um, it's, it's a great, you know, again, um, story of the open source community, you know, multi-vendor coming together to, to solve this. Like because one of the problems that uh, is that some of these functional services are tied too much to that, you know, cl cloud provider as Google or Amazon or Microsoft. So how how can you know users don't have to worry about it and they can you know move their you know around the yeah and so the idea is that you know just in the way that you know how you know Azure runs virtual machines is different than how mm -hmm. Amazon runs virtual machines different than how Google runs virtual machines you know you know the the same is true for the Azure the serverless container runtimes right, right. so the way that um, ACI works is different than the way that Fargate works and you know, Google doesn't yet have anything here but you know right. I'm, I'm assuming that they will over time right um, and so the idea is not to unify that layer the idea is to unify how this gets consumed through the CNCF sort of blessed uh, you know plumbing um, and that being in this case the Kubernetes APIs so the Kubernetes APIs are what we all agree on, and so now we can plug in these differentiated backends, but give customers a uniform and portable experience, which is what they're asking for. Right, and and uh, what kind of what kind of pricing model will there be for uh, for this? For ACI, yeah. So it's um, uh, you know it's it's interesting. The pricing model is per second billing. Mm -hmm. So if you get that granular billing, um, there can is, you go lower than the second? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, uh, actually, no. I think it is. Per, you know, it, it, you know, second is the interval. Um, uh, but it, you know, there is a, 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 a CPU price and a memory price. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I can't tell you what they are because right. there's so many zeros after the decimal. I wouldn't even know, what, you know, how much is. But it, but it's extremely, you know, low low prices. I think the a good you know comparison is if you wanted to run a one uh, virtual CPU and three and a half gig. Um, workload for a month, it would cost you about you know sixty five, sixty seven ish dollars, mm -hmm. um, which works out to about a thirty percent markup over what an equivalent Azure VM is. Right. Now we believe that markup's warranted because there are no VMs to manage. Mm -hmm. um, the speed of this thing is is incredibly compelling, and so and and customers have you know voted you know by using right. the thing that um, you know that we do believe that. Um, you know, there is sort of a, you know, a, a price markup that right, is justified. Right. Right? Yeah, because developers don't have to worry about, you know, they can just focus on the application that adds business value instead of uh, a lot of unnecessary things. Yep. Uh, but, but when we look at it, it, it does look like, you know, you have to make a lot of, you know, investment in one platform, you know, in, in a way. 
uh, and uh, serverless is relatively new. So, so what is your kind of, you know, your advice to companies that, you know, should, when they should get on this serverless bandwagon on the train now, today, yesterday or tomorrow, and why, you know, why they should, you know, have serverless as part of their strategy? Well, you know, I think you know, one of the things I would say is, you know, be careful about spending too much time on technology because it's cool or it's hot mm -hmm. or, you know, it's, 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 you know, there's buzz around it. Um, really focus on what the benefits are and, and whether your company, you know, could benefit from them. So, for example, um, you know, I think the Jadox case study is a really great example. You know, this is a company who had, you know, um, you know and you, we have others, you know, for example, who have hostile multi-tenancy. Um, and workloads that are sort of untrusted that they need to be able to run in a sandboxed way, right? And, you know, figuring out how to, you know, that's a problem statement, right? I need to figure out how to run hostile multi-tenant, you, know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, code, you know, that's untrusted. Um, and then searching the market for things, you know, serverless offerings like ACI or you know, Azure Functions or things like that that can accommodate that is, I think, the, the better way to do it. Um, but then the other thing I would say, sort of the flip side to that is, this stuff is so easy to try that, you know, That's what I was about to ask, and so much is happening that you should uh, keep, you know, dipping your toes in the new technology because you never know. You, you never know, and it's not like this stuff takes weeks yes, to, yes. to, to, to oh, get yeah, a feel these, for, right? Yeah, like, yeah. You, can, you can, in a few hours, mm -hmm. get a feel for what Azure Functions you know, looks and feels like and, and how you might use it. I mean, we, one of the things I love at, at Microsoft is we put a huge amount of effort um, into our documentation. We have terrific quick starts and guides. So if you've got, you know, a free couple hours and you want to try it out, go check out Azure Functions, go check out ACI, right? Yeah, and, and if you don't keep up with what is going on, you'll be left behind so far, right? And when you do talk about documentation, uh, a lot of these technologies are new. So, so how, how do you kind of uh, help, you know, your partners or your customers, you know, do, do you run any kind of programs to help them? This is actually one of the really cool things about Microsoft is, you know, because of Microsoft's history, mm -hmm. Microsoft has, you know, this army of folks out right. in the field um, that have been working with customers for, you know, decades in mm -hmm. cases, right? And so, um, you know, those folks, you know, part of my job as, you know, a product owner inside of Azure is to make sure that this field is armed with, you know, not just documentation, but reference architectures, guides, trainings, you know, for, you know, for themselves. Um, and that's actually a big focus of what we do because um, if we're gonna reach all the customers that we need to reach and help all the people we need to help, we're gonna have to lean on that field um, in order to do that. Right. And, and before we wrap up, one other question, because I talk about open source, what is the open source angle here with this, uh, with the ACI? Well, you know, the open source angle is, you know, sort of what I mentioned about the virtual kubelet, you okay. know, uh, project. That's really the the, the main focus um, is making sure that, um, you know, we already have, you know, Amazon and VMware and um, uh, I believe some others, uh, you know, that are in the community helping, you know, put pull requests in on this project, helping make this vision of serverless containers um, and I would argue a vision, a uh, go forward vision of serverless Kubernetes, mm -hmm. right? Kubernetes without any VMs, mm -hmm. imagine that. Um, make that vision a reality, and so there is a, a sort of a, a working group, uh, you know, of us, um, you know, trying to trying to achieve that. Thank you, thank yeah. you so much. It was nice meeting you again, and we'll be seeing you again at the yeah. KubeCon. Great.